director of the Environmental League of Massachusetts. It's an environmental advocacy organization that's been around since 1898. It's still operating today. And uh, in addition to that, I'm a resident of Massachusetts and also raising the two children here. And I'd like you to hear my comments in, in that context as well as in the advocacy context. You've heard uh, about the importance of combating climate change. Uh, I won't go into the details because I'm sure all well versed in it. Uh, experts on the issue of referred to climate change as a planetary emergency. Anytime you hear the word emergency, you should ask yourself if it's hyperbole. But I think any, anyone following the science has got to agree that this is legitimately a planetary emergency. And so I think as you review uh, uh, this, this lease permit, the go through the environmental assessment, you are going to hear uh, concerns related to habitat, related to navigability, fisheries, uh, birds, so on and so forth. And I encourage you to pay close attention to legitimate concerns and to work very hard to make sure that legitimate concerns are in fact abated. But in addition to that, I can tell you from watching the Cape Wind debate up close for a decade, uh, I guarantee you that you've already and will continue to hear concerns that are cloaked in habitat and navigability and fisheries. But let's face it, at their core, are actually about beauty. People are resistant to change as it is usually. Um, this is a beautiful ocean area, and there are people on the coast that are concerned about aesthetics, but they might not present it uh, in that way. And we've seen that used um, very effectively to block Cape Wind for quite some time. Uh, we've also heard about the, the offsetting fact that climate change is actually threatening ocean resources directly itself, with ocean acidification and uh, other reasons. And so <clears throat> as you consider concerns, try to please try to separate out legitimate from illegitimate concerns, number one. And then as you consider the legitimate concerns, weigh those against countervailing legitimate concerns about impact on oceans and on climate change. And the last thing I'll say is, is that, um, again, we're getting back to this issue uh, that people don't like to talk about, but it's, it's just a fact of uh, NIMBYism on projects like this. Uh, this area is located off the, the, the uh, South Shore, but it's in federal waters. And as someone who doesn't live on the South Shore, I can appreciate there, but I own just as much of that area as anyone on the South Shore does. Everyone in this country owns this area equally. We all need clean power. Climate change affects all of us. So please uh, take that into consideration. Next speaker is Zach Alton with Oceana. I'm going to keep this brief. Uh, my name is Zach Alton with Oceana. Oceana is an ocean conservation organization. We're international, and I'm the campaign organizer here in Massachusetts. Um, I want to thank you guys for this opportunity. Um, Oceana is going to submit comprehensive comments online, but I will say that we're very optimistic about offshore wind in Massachusetts, and we appreciate that this process is moving forward. Thank you. I'm Catherine Bosley, National Wildlife Federation, and we'll be submitting detailed comments to the docket, so I'll keep my remarks uh, brief today. Um, but I did want to just uh, thank you on behalf of NWS, 4 million members nationwide, over 100,000 of which uh, reside here in Massachusetts, for your efforts along with um, our friends at the Commonwealth in, in pursuing offshore wind energy um, here in this region. Uh, National Wildlife Federation believes strongly that global warming is the single greatest threat to wildlife on this planet and that we have got to get serious about clean energy sooner than later. And of course, we need to do it right, and we are grateful for the dialogue with you um, through the Habitat Working Group and these various um, opportunities for public comment. Um, we believe it can be, offshore wind can be developed in a way that is protective of our coastal and marine wildlife. And we think that the process that you're going through, the part from the start, or with smart, as my friend Jack would say, uh, from the start is absolutely the way to go to ensure that we do that. Um, again, we have got to get serious about renewable energy. Everything about our dependence on fossil fuels is devastating to wildlife, from fuel extraction all the way up to the pollution that it emits leading to climate change, mercury, and all sorts of other problems that affect wildlife, and of course people and threatens our national security and hinders our economic um, vitality. There's so many reasons why we need to get to clean energy. Massachusetts has such a great um, resource. Just
just about four stars, looking at the map of the whole area. I mean, the Massachusetts call area really does stand out as a huge chunk of the ocean where we can generate a lot of clean energy. And we're very excited uh, to see, see that happen. Um, so again, we appreciate um, this process and want to, as, our, as my other colleagues from the Habitat group mentioned, obviously there are a lot of concerns of how we do this and making sure we do it right for wildlife
if we're going to be able to really maximize what you guys can do and the offshore wind potential or other forms of energy, we can do so by building a grid and building it at sea. The idea that most of the folks that live uh, in proximity to the ocean can be easily served by such a, an offshore transmission grid, the idea that the, the wind farm uh, concepts that are uh, up for discussion here in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island are also being undertaken between here and Georgia, really, um, I think bode well for the idea of a common offshore transmission environment. So I think it's important to, to raise that point because I think the, the ability for us to think about transmission in the future the ability for us to think of the national security implications of having a grid that could sustain, because it's very at sea and it can be designed in part, quite frankly, using modern networking techniques, uh, that would sustain a, an attack or sustain some type of a natural disaster in the event of such a thing, heaven forbid, uh, would have significant benefit. The second benefit to that, of course, is the industrial benefit of that. One of the things I think gets lost is um, when you are installing turbines, you're also installing cables installing a network like I just described, just to give you an example, a single season might be 150 miles. We did a project in, in, um, between the Netherlands and Great Britain. That was about the distance of it. A project like that takes four vessels minimum, installation vessel. It takes about a million hours of our time, just our company alone, as all other companies are involved. And the types of projects we're talking about to do the things that we just described in this common permeated environment are hundreds and hundreds of miles of potential um, uh, business. So the industrial potential for that, because remember, of those four vessels that I mentioned that are just global vessels, there are zero in the United States that could do that work today. So all of that is pure potential as far as companies like ours is concerned. And of course, the most beneficial thing of all of it is the green power that you could get. So if you could actually envision zones of five gigawatts and larger up and down the coast, and you interconnected them with the common grid, and then you were able to tap right into the metro areas and bypass a lot of the risks inherent with the grid that we currently live with, I think there's a long-term strategic benefit, not just to Massachusetts or New England, but for the entire coastal region. Thank you. Sue Reed, CLF, Massachusetts. Hi, my name is Sue Reed. I'm the director of the Massachusetts Office of Energy Policy. environmental advocacy organization, we are focused on shutting down the region's fleet of dirty, aging, uneconomic, polluting fossil generation, and also at the same time working to advance a clean energy future. Um, and we see no other resource on the generation side that carries the sheer potential of offshore wind to displace gigawatts of this aging fossil generation that we need to shut down. So I think it's impossible to overstate the level of importance and urgency with moving forward with this Smart from the Start or Wicked Smart from the Start initiative. Um, and of course, climate change from our perspective provides an overarching context um, that helps bring into sharp focus the need for offshore wind for advancing this resource expeditiously and responsibly. But as others have pointed out, there are also so many other advantages to this in terms of national energy security liability, diversity, price hedge benefits, um, the, the advantages go on and on. Um, we are encouraged by and would like to continue to encourage ongoing state and federal partnership, such as we're seeing here with the working groups that have been formed, the fisheries and habitat working group. Um, we'd like to see um, with the data that's being brought forward by Massachusetts continue to infuse this process. I think Massachusetts was very forward-looking through its Massachusetts the Energy Center, I believe about a year ago, commissioning further collection of data and assimilation of data to close some of those real or perceived gaps in terms of avian species, um, marine mammals, including white right whales. Um, and I think we're ahead of the curve in that respect. The Mid-Atlantic might be somewhat ahead in the Smart from the Start program in terms of the EA and the FONSI that's been issued on that. But we believe that through this partnership, through the affirmative outreach to stakeholders and tremendous public participation engagement um, that we've already started to see, that we will leapfrog the Mid-Atlantic in a race that we really, really like to see. Um, we're optimistic um, that the issues that have been raised are solvable. For example, we do 
do need to take seriously the right whale issue. Um, but at the same time, we believe that we can manage this through time of year protocols and so forth with respect to geophysical and geotechnical <coughs> surveys, for example, that this is something that we can resolve and do so expeditiously. Uh, I think it's remarkable the number of environmental faces and voices we see in the room. If this were a project about unleashing coal or oil, I think you'd see a dramatically different context. Um, and that's because the environmental community broadly is really geared toward getting to yes on this issue and working with you to solve this and, and move forward smart from the start to unleash the real potential of offshore rent wind. I had one really discreet question that doesn't necessarily need to be answered right now. Uh, the slide presentation and um, Mo's remarks seem to draw a distinction between site characterization and site assessment um, and putting geophysical, geotechnical surveys in the site characterization um, area and um, in the site assessment category, things like met towers and buoys that would be attached to the ocean floor. My understanding is that all of this will be encompassed in site assessment plans. Um, and if that's mistaken, then I um, would love clarification on that. We'll submit more detailed comments and again, really look forward to continuing to work with your team at BOEM with the um, terrific participation from the Patrick administration and a host of other stakeholders that are actively engaged.